our project in a broad sense involves the uh, conversion of biomass derived compounds into fuels and chemicals. So the uh, specific project we have right now funded by NSF involves trying to take uh, small molecules and couple them to make carbon-carbon bonds such that when we remove all of the oxygen from the, from the material we're going to have long chain hydrocarbons that would fit into a gasoline or a diesel or a jet fuel application. Well, it started pretty much in the year 2000. I had been working for 20 years in the area of heterogeneous catalysis, and, and that area is, is using solid materials to speed up desired chemical reactions. And, I'd be, and I've been applying that uh, field to petroleum catalysis and environmental catalysis, mainly uh, 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 cleanup of emissions from power plants and uh, automobiles. And in the year 2000, I was looking for a, a new direction to work, but staying in the catalysis area. And we thought of this idea of trying to use catalysts to convert biomass and also carbohydrate sugars into fuels and chemicals. And we've been working on that pretty much ever since. What we hope to learn is how to take a, a biomass molecule like a sugar and to selectively break certain chemical bonds in the molecule to make desired products. So if you look at a sugar, for example, glucose, which is the most abundant sugar in nature, it's a molecule that has six carbons and six oxygens. Now, by contrast, if you look at a molecule in gasoline, you would see a molecule that maybe has uh, eight carbon atoms with no oxygens. So what you have to do if you're going to convert a, a sugar into a gasoline component is you're going to have to break all of the carbon-oxygen bonds. But while you're doing so, you do not want to break carbon-carbon bonds because if you, make, if you break those bonds, you're going to make light gases like methane and ethane, and those you're not going to be able to store in your gasoline tank. So there's an example of, of trying to take a molecule that has more functionality in it and remove that functionality without degrading the molecule. So that's kind of the heart of what we're trying to do. But we do have some results. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, we started this, this, this project in about the year 2000. One of our first results was in 2002. And there, what we, what we learned how to do was to take the sugar molecule and actually break the carbon-carbon bonds without breaking the carbon-oxygen bonds, which is exactly the opposite of what I just described to you if you're making gasoline. But if you look at the sugar and you break all of the carbon-carbon bonds, what you then have is carbon monoxide, CO, and hydrogen. Now, we know carbon monoxide is poisonous, but if you do that in the presence of water, then the wa water reacts with the carbon monoxide to give you carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So now what you have is a process for making hydrogen from the sugar. And uh, that hydrogen then could be used for a fuel cell. And that's, uh, in, that was pretty much the, the uh, motivation for that particular project was a hydrogen fuel cell application. Now having done that, we then formed a company with uh, one of my former uh, PhD and postdocs, Randy Courtright, and uh, Randy spun off this company called Virant Energy Systems, which is now in Madison, and is going great guns in trying to commercialize this hydrogen technology as well as others that we might be talking about a little bit, uh, a little bit later today. So that was our first result in the area. So well, our area clearly is, is trying to target into biofuels and biochemicals. The difference being, uh, we know what a biofuel is, but a biochemical then would be a compound we would make from biomass, renewable, that might go into a polymer, for example. So making polyesters, making polyamides, uh, making you know just high-tech materials from renewable resources would be a direction then of this uh, uh, chemical application. Then there's the fuel application. So that, that would be the relevance. Now, if you look at biofuels today, it's really ethanol. Ethanol is really the, the, the starting with sugars. Now there is biodiesel starting with oils, but starting with sugars, 
ethanol is the, is the current technology. And if you think about ethanol, that technology really is fermentation that goes very, very far back. So that's a rather mature uh, direction. Now, people are still making advances in ethanol right now and making the fermentation better, trying to ferment C5 sugars instead of C6 sugars. So there's still work to be done there. But our thought then was if we could bring in this area of heterogeneous catalysis, which had been exploited exclusively in the, not exclusively, but mainly in the petrochemical area, and see would these catalysts allow new directions in the biofuels, new opportunities? And that's kind of where we, where we want to go on that. So for the, for the person looking at this from the outside, I think if this all works out well, you will take your sugar, now, where the sugar comes from, we might want to discuss, but you would take your sugar, and then you would have your fermentation option for making ethanol, but then there would be a heterogeneous catalytic option that might be orthogonal to that, that would allow you to make things like gasoline, jet, and diesel fuel, which would now give you a lot of opportunities for, for making specific fuels in specific regions for specific reasons. Well, I think the people who would benefit are those that uh, you have mentioned, and that clearly it's, I think, a, a, a wonderful opportunity for students because it's an emerging area, and I think uh, we as engineers and scientists uh, can have a tremendous impact on the way we use our renewable resources effectively. So I think it's a great career opportunity for students. I think for policymakers, there's also some opportunities here in that if you look at the funding situation, uh, you know, right now, a lot of money is going to the ethanol area uh, because, uh, and, and that work will undoubtedly continue. But really, policymakers ha- are currently being made aware of these other opportunities of converting resources into fuels. And I think we're already beginning to see funding change in that direction as well. So I think policymakers are also looking at, uh, at the impact of this. How I became a scientist really is, uh, it was determined by, by mentors that I've had throughout my, my whole life. So when I start with my, my father was an electrical engineer, so uh, he was instrumental in, 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 in me having technical interests. I had a chemistry set as a, as a kid. My high school teachers, I enjoyed chemistry and, and math. And if you put chemistry and math together, that's kind of chemical engineering, so I came to UW-Madison right here and uh, was uh, mentored by a lot of great faculty here. And, and as a senior in the department, as an undergraduate, I had a research project. And it turned out it was in the catalysis area. And I said, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't know how it worked. And I was fascinated by it. And then my advisor here suggested I do graduate work in the catalysis area with a world-famous mentor, Michelle Boudard, at uh, Stanford University. So I went to work for Boudar and I loved the field, and he encouraged me to stay in it, and uh, I, this is where I am today, really. I, in terms of influencing students going into science, I have to say I've, I'm really not a, a, a deep thinker <laughs> in this area, so what I would say probably would be fairly trivial, but certainly as a, what I would say is that as a, as a practitioner in this area, it's a very, very exciting area. I think we are doing things that are very important for our society, for, for our country, and they're all technically based. So I think you, with, you really can't make an impact in this area without the strong technical background. So I think the message to the young people, it, it has to be quite young in their, in, their, in their schooling, is if they stay with their technical training, then all of these incredible opportunities will open up to them. But if they, if they don't follow through on their technical training and they lose those skills, then at an early age, it's really hard for us to, to really make up for that. So I, I, I think it would, the, the, the idea would be to, to really show them the excitement out there if they only have the skills that we could then enhance in the, uh, in the graduate school. Yeah, no, that question is, uh, is very, very good in that 
you know, wh where have we taken it and what do we need to move ahead? Uh, I would like to believe if I put on my optimistic hat, and again, I think as a scientist you always have to be optimistic because there's no room for pessimism because so many things fail that if you're a pessimist, then you shut down. So you have to be optimistic in this business. So putting on the optimistic hat, I would say that as we, now I mean the my profession of uh, chemical engineers and people in catalysis uh, like myself, as we as a field continue to work in how we can take sugars and other biomass compounds and figure out ways to selectively break certain bonds to make fuels and chemicals, I believe we will have tremendous success in making processes that are analogous to those in a petroleum refinery. Now, a, petro a petroleum refinery, you have to realize, is a highly integrated structure where almost every atom of carbon going in is accounted for as a product or as an energy stream or as something useful. And all of the heat is integrated. If you give off heat in one place, you use it in another. So it's a highly integrated set of unit operations, a lot of those being uh, catalytic. So I believe in this process of taking biomass now, or taking sugars, I should say, and converting them into fuels and chemicals. As a field, we should be able to optimize those processes to make with very, very high efficiency things that society wants, materials and fuels. But what's limiting the field right now, where I don't really have a vision on, on, on how to solve this, this is other people's work, is where does that sugar come from? Right now, all of our sugar comes from corn, and we realize that that's not sustainable. There's this whole issue of, of energy versus food, and you know, food has to win in that competition. So that everyone recognizes the source of the sugar is going to have to come from other streams. For example, forest residues, the parts of the plants that you can't eat, potentially energy crops that could be grown in very high yields. And right now, the technology for converting those non-edible streams into nice sugar streams is still lacking. A lot of people are working on it, and uh, this, this whole area of uh, the lignocellulose, cellulosic ethanol, are all uh, efforts where, they're tr where, where, where scientists, engineers, are trying to figure out how to deconstruct uh, polymeric biomass into the soluble sugar streams that people need for ethanol. Now what we would do is we would intercept those sugars and instead of going to ethanol we would take them to other fuels and chemicals but still we need that sugar stream and it's not going to come from the grains of corn. So I'm not working in the area, it's, uh, I have some ideas but they're very premature. Other people hopefully will tackle that problem and then would coupled with the catalytic technologies that our field is putting together, I think we'll have a very, very nice uh, infrastructure now in going from non-edible biomass to the fuels and chemicals that our society needs. I think one aspect of, of, our, of the work we've done here that I think has been you know, quite satisfying was was for me to sit back and see the emergence of this new company, Virant Energy Systems. So I, as, as I mentioned, it was a, a startup company that Randy Courtright and myself formed at that time to make hydrogen from, uh, from biomass for the fuel cell uh, application. Now I have to say that I don't have a direct involvement in Virant because I'm a university professor and what we have to do is publish information and understand fundamental things, whereas at Virant, their job now is to make commercial products. But I do, I have watched what they've done from, from the outside, and it's very satisfying to see now that they've, they've gone from a company that's been started at, from the UW on very fundamental uh, uh, discoveries. They've taken those now and developed processes for actually making gasoline and liquid, uh, liquid fuels that some of the major players, some of the major petroleum companies are very interested in exploring. And Virant Energy now, I understand, is now going to be putting together a small pilot plant to make, I believe, one barrel of green gasoline a day. And if that is successful, and I'm sure it will be, 
then they'll they'll go on from there. So uh, again, I've I've had nothing to do with with that effort, but it was part of it was started from work here at Wisconsin, and, and I've been kind of very very proud to see how they've developed as a as a entrepreneurial activity from university research now to something that could be quite practical and have a quite big impact on the, on the energy picture.